Everybody, Central America, and good to have your friends and family back home. Amen. Amen. Well, go ahead and praise the Lord. I ask a few guys uh, to and, and gals, perhaps, to uh, share just a brief word. We're not going to take forty people sharing their testimony today. We take three or four services, but I did ask a few to share a couple of highlights with you. So uh, uh, I'm going to let you and perhaps Jordan go first if you'd like. Praise the Lord. The rest of y'all, be ready. Amen. This works. Good morning, Gary. Good morning. <laughs> I'm already crying. I'm sorry. <laughs> Come on, bro. Come on. Uh, I went to, you know, we'll wait. It might take 40 minutes. <laughs> For those who went on the trip, you understand that phrase. I'll wait. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Um, I went to Belize. Cold. My heart was, was callous. And uh, God, God knew I needed to be there, and, and he, he knew the men that needed to be there. And uh, I guess on the second night, a uh, bunch of us guys started talking, and it's so, God was moving in that moment, and the Holy Spirit was there because we were all fighting the same thing, and we all were all in the same place and the same struggles, and, and, and we made a point right then and there to be accountable, accountable to each other, and, and, and it really just changed the whole trip um, for the remaining of the time we were there, and so I, I'm here today just to ask you to plead to you, hold me accountable. Um, second trip with my son, and he is my inspiration to be a godly man, to the, uh, to the man he's becoming. I see God working him, and he hit the ground running. He knows no stranger around him, and he is visiting with anybody and everybody. Uh, and, that, and that's a testimony, and, and that's, if anything, it is, it's, it's exciting for me, and it makes me want to go out and witness to people. But Belize is easy. Being down there talking to people and, and, and being around like-minded people, it's here where my struggle is. And so uh, just pray for me. Uh, it, was a, it was a great trip, and, and I can't wait to go again. So that's, that's all I have to say. I'm done. <laughs> This is my second time, and uh, both times, I, uh, both times, what spoke to me was that the humbleness of everyone there. Um, I don't think one person I met complained about where they lived, how they lived, what conditions they lived with, or who they lived with. And we want to complain that we didn't have any Wi-Fi at the hotel, but they're they're over there. <laughs> I mean, uh, and and it's, it's funny because you know we complain about every little thing, but the things we complain about, not even half of them have. Um, so that's what got me both times is, uh, uh, that the humbleness of everyone there. And then, uh, second, um, the week before we went to Belize, um, this is my first summer, me and my brother's first summer staying home alone because either my mom or dad has been, or usually both of them have been there, but, uh, this is our first summer alone. So that first week, uh, I would wake up and I had nothing to do. And uh, growing, I, I grew up in this church, so uh, a lot of people told me to read my Bible and stuff. And I, 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 I never really got a grip of how much it meant. And so uh, the, the week before we went, I read the Bible. And I prayed about um, that I can have an open heart and open ears to what they had to say. And while I was down there, I led five people to Christ. So. And, uh, I'm done. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Philip and Crystal, Katie, if you want, praise the Lord. Katie's so talkative, I just don't know. She's the shiny one. She stayed a little too long in the tropical sun for that fair skin. Um, this trip had a little different dynamic for me. Um, just a little. 
Um, in the past, I've gone and I've been kind of, um, you know, in the background. And this time, it was a little different for me because I, you know, took part in planning and everything. But the week before we went in youth that night, we went through to each individual youth. And I asked them, okay, so what is it that could possibly hinder God using you in Belize? And each individual youth would say, um, you know, maybe my attitude or um, my negativity or, and I wrote, we wrote every one of them down and I put mine in, you know, what my weakness might be. And we prayed over each one of those things. And I have to say that while we were there, I didn't see a bad attitude. They were constantly positive. And even when it felt like maybe I was, you know, getting stressed out, just in the perfect moment, God would send one of my youth to me with encouragement. And to say that I am proud of them is an understatement because no amount of preparation that I could have given them, it was all God. You guys bless me more than you can even know. The dramas, they really stepped up and they performed and, you know, they were coming to me asking, when can we do another drama? Can we, you know, we were going street witnessing, witnessing. can we do another drama there? And um, just their constant desire to be used by God was just such a blessing for me um, in the midst of, you know, whatever may have been going on, you know, and I told him before we got started, I, before we even went, I said, you know, what my weakness is going to be is that, you know, the plan, 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 plan. I need to make sure that I stop and take in what God is doing. And he really allowed me to do that. And a lot of that was through watching, you know, the guys, the youth that I am able to minister with on a weekly basis. I was able to go into Belize and minister with the, with them. And, you know, I felt like a proud parent. And for those parents that didn't go, be proud of your children because they were amazing. Their unity and their heart, they loved Jesus. And, you know, the adults, they really stepped up. My dad, Gary, um, every adult we had stepped up and were able to, what we weren't, what I wasn't able to do, they were able to just step up and fall into place and everything. You know, when we had things go wrong, and let me tell you, Satan tried <laughs> to ruin every chance that we had, but we were victorious. We saw souls come to know the Lord. And that's really what it's all about. At the end of the day, Satan lost the battle. Um, it was a great, it was an awesome trip. All right, so day one, most of y'all know this. Two years ago, I left my heart in police. Had a girl down there that I've been ministering to for about eight years, and me and Katie went to see her, and she wasn't there. Moved her to Mexico and then Guatemala. So the first day when we got on the bus, I told the bus driver, I said, when we get to the Friendship, I need a, I need a taxi. And, uh, got to the Friendship, took care of what we needed to with Crystal. Me and Katie hopped, on a, hopped in a car and went to her school. <clears throat> Not knowing what I was going to find, but she was there. When we got back on the bus, I told told everybody, I said, it's going to be a good trip. <laughs> and, uh, and it was. It was Y'all's kids were, were a ministry to me. Uh, Wednesday morning, we went to a school. We met a boy named Allen. Got a form of uh, muscular dystrophy. He told us he had two years to live. Principal shared with me that uh, he didn't have a wheelchair. They had to carry him everywhere he went. So uh, we 
got back to the hotel and Brother Joe went his way. <laughs> Me and some of the guys and Katie and Alyssa went our way. Well, we ended up with two wheelchairs. <laughs> standing in the revival that night the door's behind me and I'm standing there and I catch something out of the corner of my eye and I look over and it's him with his mom pushing him in his wheelchair so we went through the revival and he came down him and his brother came down that night and I was ministering with somebody I don't and afterwards, I went over and uh, the little boy looked up at me. This kid don't talk. Very quiet. He looked at me and he said, I love you. And I knelt down and I prayed with him and I asked him, I said, uh, what'd you come down for tonight? Katie and Gary got to pray with him and they accepted Christ that night. <laughs> this trip was different. Uh, but in the difference of our past, we got to do a lot of uh, ministry within our group. Whether it be on the bus, giving testimonies while the kids were in school, preaching, doing their dramas, uh, whether it was at the hotel. <clears throat> and, uh, I just ask that y'all would continue to pray for not only the group that went, but the men of this church. As the men of this church, we need to step up. We need to meet, be the godly men that God has called us to be. We need to quit sitting back and allowing other people to do what we should do. Okay, Sunday morning, Brother Joe preached a sermon in Belize City, or in Belmapan, that the men of Belize need to get their pants back. Amen. Gentlemen, Amen. let's get our pants back. Amen. Let's be the godly men that God has called us to be. Praise the Lord. Christian, come here right quick. Christian went with us. Some of you don't recognize Christian. He's not hiding behind his hair. <laughs> Who made you cut your hair? I didn't tell you to cut your hair. I didn't want to be hot. <laughs> it is hot there, isn't it? <laughs> okay. So, on the 17th, the, day, the second to last day of the revival, um, something was tugging at my heart. I haven't been real with God the past couple years, and I thought I was... I played the act, I did the part, but I didn't actually, I wasn't actually with God. And the second last night of revival, he just told me, go, go to the front. And I went to the front, I prayed with him. Jordan asked me, are you counseling? I said, no. So I prayed with Brother Philip and I gave my life to the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hey, Barry, thanks for playing drums today. Praise the Lord. Good to see young Master Carter here. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Is there someone else I spoke to about sharing? Raise your hand. Don't, I don't want to leave you out. Praise the Lord. All right. Well, get up here. I knew there was someone else. Who was it? We ought to make your daughter share. Are you going to speak for their behalf? My girls can come. Um, a couple, maybe weeks or months ago, Pastor Joe had preached a sermon about um, who would fill in the gap and who would go, um, go out into the world. And that day I came down and I said, you know, me, Lord, I'll, I'll go. And, um, but I meant that I would go here locally. I didn't mean that I would go overseas. This was my first time um, on a trip. This was my first time flying international. I'm not a fan of flying. 
And um, I had recruited Robbie to go and told him that it was really, he, he was the one that needed to go. Um, he could represent our family and um, he could have time with the girls. And um, the more I said that, the more I knew that the Lord was really convicting me to go. And um, he ended up due to work and whatnot. He said, I can't go. He said, but in the moment that I realized that I couldn't go, I knew it was you that was supposed to go. And um, I said, okay. Um, at first, I went very reluctantly. I um, told Crystal I was not happy. And um, I was not really happy with God at that moment that I did not want to fly. And um, but when I finally, God really got a hold of me. And when I finally said, okay, it's me that's going. And um, we began to plan, and it became exciting. I grew up in, um, in the Catholic Church, and we didn't have opportunities like this. Um, and so for me, the exciting part was that my girls could start a mission-minded ministry at their ages. And at the age that I am, this was my first trip to ever go. And um, one of the things that, you know, my family said was, you know, there's, there's poor here, there's people here that you can help. But it was really about me getting out of my comfort zone and me getting out to, um, to experience the things. And um, like Jordan said, to really be thankful for the things that I have and, um, and that we have been afforded here. Um, and there are people that we can minister to and we should, um, but how often do we? And um, that's what really, um, really tugged at my heart. And, um, but more than anything, it was for the legacy that we leave behind. Um, our children are, will see things that I will never see. They, they are our messengers into the future. And um, if, I can, if we can equip them um, to be good messengers, then how much better will the next generation be? And um, I just see all these people, and we could have filled up a whole plane with just Believers Fellowship. And if you would, and I was thinking about this earlier, um, if you would save $60 a month from now until two years from now, your trip would be paid for and you wouldn't need an ounce of fundraising. So I would challenge each of you to go, especially if you have kids, because um, seeing them minister is what I know God wanted me to see. Um, to see them street witnessing. They had no fear. Um, and that's, um, that was the greatest gift that I could have received. So. Praise the Lord. I'm done. Amen. And we did. We, we worked them hard. Usually when we go to these, these uh, schools uh, and the, to Belize, we do like three or four school assemblies a day. We see all the kids out in the yard and we bring them all the classes out and we preach and teach and uh, we had two problems this year. One, we went a week later than normal, so we didn't get in as many schools. Many schools were already graduating, getting out. We did get in some. We had great meetings there. Uh, the second problem was going a week later, we also hit into the deeper part of the rainy season. So we were dealing with rain battles constantly during the day, off the bus, on the bus, start a rally, stop a rally, you know, those kind of things. So we were always having to adapt and adjust. Now, I know the last slides that were shown a while ago in that presentation where everybody playing on the beach and having fun, uh, that was one day out of all the days. The last day, uh, we just kind of go out there and just have a lot of fun. You're snorkeling and diving, whatever you're, whatever you're capable of doing, and it's always a great time of the Lord. But uh, it's, it was kind of a, a refreshing day. But each of you who went, I, want, I tell you what, everybody that went on the trip, stand up real quick. I want everybody in the church to see who it was. Praise the Lord. Come on, if you're on the trip, you stand up. Give them a praise the Lord. Of course, somewhere with the other Magnolia campus as well. Amen. Let's, uh, let's hold on a minute. We have a word to share with you. So I'm going to give you a little devotion yesterday. Of course, I was accused by Terry Acker this morning. I was accused by Terry Acker this morning of never doing devotions. He said it may be 10 minutes long, still a sermon with you. So we'll see how it works. And we went into the country, into Belize, in the churches, schools, wherever we are. There's some people, when you enter in, who have no idea what you're talking about. The gospel message is not really something that, if they have heard it, they haven't comprehended it. It hadn't sunk in, it hadn't sunk down yet. And so when you give invitations in places like that, or even here in the States, there's some people who, who you know, it's new to them, and they, they're interested, and they're wanting to come. Many times they'll come forward, they'll pray, and they want to go on from there. And then there's always people who very well know what the gospel message is, 
And for some of them, they've been running from God a long, long, long time. You know, and, and to hear the message and given the opportunity to respond to that message, they immediately react and respond. And there's brokenness and joy and excitement, just as that person who's really just now becoming familiar with the gospel message. Unfortunately, you know, we shouldn't have to go through those relationships and problems and hassles that we often go through. But if you look, look in Luke chapter 15, we're going to look at verses 11 through 24. It is a parable that Jesus is giving, which probably 99.9999% of you are familiar with. It's the parable of the prodigal son. And it said, and he said, a man had two sons. The, the younger of them said to his father, father, give me this share of the state that falls to me. So he divided the wealth between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together and went on a journey into a distant country. And there he squandered everything on riotous or loose living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine occurred in that country and he began to be impoverished. Hold on right there. Isn't that the way it works? By the time you have one trouble, then comes another. You know, just about the time I need a job, the economy fails. Isn't that the way it works? <laughs> one problem after another. So verse 15, he went and he hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods that the swine were eating and no one was giving him anything to him. And when he was come to his senses, you can underline that, had a revelation, he said, how many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread? I'm dying here with hunger, I'm starved. I'll get up, I'll go to my father, I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. So he got up. Important words. And he came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him, felt compassion for him, ran, embraced and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, I'm not worthy to be called your son. The father said to his slaves, quickly bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand, sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and he's come to life again. He was lost and he's been found and they began to celebrate. Now the story goes on and tells about the other son in the house who's just as prodigal as the, this first son is and has his own set of problems. But there are times when like this prodigal, we get to the place, we're just ready for God to do something. Kind of been there that sick and tired of being sick and tired. Now, unfortunately, when a lot of people get to that place, they don't do what they need to do. They continue to go on and be sick and tired of being sick and tired. I've been there in that situation in my own life and testimony is multiple times coming to that place of realization and then putting it off or neglecting or, or saying maybe tomorrow and not just coming to a place where I needed to like this, this young man does in, in this particular parable. There are times when you, you just... You need to seize the moment that God is giving you. There's, there is a war that's going on. And you need to realize that what you're facing is more than just a conviction or feeling guilty or feeling bad, that you are in a spiritual war. And even though you cannot see the host of hell, even though you cannot see the demons, they're still real, they're still there, and whether you believe it or not, they are still active and they're doing everything they can to keep you blind and to deceive you. And if they can't keep you blind, nor if they can deceive you any further, then they will seek to get you, favorite tactic, put it off. Don't do it. Don't do it now. Do it some other time. This is, don't do it. This is not the moment, some other time. Because Satan's greatest appeal to all of us is that battle with our pride. But perhaps you're here today. And perhaps you're in a place in your own life, you say, you know, I am just sick and tired of being sick and tired. I'm battling with the same old, same old forever. When, when is the end of this going to come? Well, <clears throat> let me give you a simple just devotional this morning on how to come home. Because a lot of people, they wrestle with the things that seem to be obvious. And they hit a wall and they say, I just don't know where to go from here. This young man does exactly what needs to be done and demonstrates for each and every one of us how we have to respond to the Spirit of God when we do come to the end of ourselves. Number one is simple. And you quit running the slides by now, okay? Thank you. One, allow God to show you the depth of your rebellion. He's in a place. He sees where he's come to. It's a shameful place, especially for a Jewish boy to be feeding pigs. 
It's a dirty place. It's a miserable place. And they're not paying him enough to even go get food on his own. He has to eat what the pigs are eating. And all too often that's a picture of a lot of people today who are out there in the world just sustaining themselves on what the world is sustaining themselves on. They don't realize there's a spiritual life. They don't realize there's a full life. They don't realize there's an abundant life. They just think this is all there is. And when they look at people who do know the Lord, they just think they have some kind of religion attack to their lives. And it goes well beyond some kind of religion. It goes back to a dynamic relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Allow God to show you the depth of your rebellion. He comes to his senses. How do you do that? Well, one, look at him. He's not blaming anybody at this point, is he? He's not blaming anyone or anything. He's not saying, you know, I ought to go back to the house, but there's so many hypocrites at the house. I ought to go back and deal with this issue, but I, you know, I got my brother there. You know, he's Mr. Christianity. <laughs> He doesn't use all that stuff. He doesn't look at anybody else. He's not blaming anybody, and he's not comparing himself anymore. He's not saying, yeah, I'm bad, but I'm not as bad as the pig. I'm bad, but I'm not as bad as those guys I used to party with. Those guys are insane. Or I'm, you know, well, I'm not, and, and people do this all the time, and they, they specifically like to point out people in the church or in Christendom who have fallen, who are making a miserable testimony for the Lord in their life, and they'll say, okay, I'm bad, but I'm not as bad as so-and-so. Look at them, and look what they did, and look where they are. He's not doing that. He's not excusing himself. He's not blaming himself, and he's not comparing himself. He's not saying, oh, it's so hard, but, you know, I'd like to come, but, you know, I, I know I need to come, and I know I need to get right with God, but, you know, it's so, it's difficult here, and, and my situation is different than everybody else's situation. I mean, I want you to think for a moment how stupid that is. That's a theological word, by the way. <laughs> Just how stupid that is. The Bible puts it like this. There hath no temptation taken you, but such is common to man. What does that mean? Everything you're being tempted by, the rest of the world's being tempted by. What's that mean? You're not as unique as you would like to think. It, you, you can't say to God, well, my, my, I would, but my, my case is unique. It doesn't work that way. All have sinned, all have fallen short of the glory, the soul that sins shall die, he that believes not is condemned already. Hey, it's just the way it is, and, and we all fall under that banner. But when you turn that around, for God so up all the world that he gave his only begotten son. So if we're really going to get to the place, I'm going to see God do something in my life. It's more than turning over a new leaf. It's more than making a list of to do's of what I'm going to do better. Now I'm going to try harder. It goes beyond that. It comes to the place that I can't do anything. I'm not able. I can't stop what I need to stop. I can't start what I need to start. I'm, I'm just stuck in, I'm, I'm stuck in the mud with the pigs. That's where my life is. And so when you quit the blaming and the excusing and the comparing, you come to verse 17 and he just said, you know, he's just saying, hey, it's not worth it being here. I, I, he says, uh, when he came to his senses, and this is how you know you've come to your senses. He says, this stinks being here. This, this way I'm living stinks. And I'm tired of living this way. My pride, what other people think of, is not worth the price I'm paying anymore. So I'm going to leave my pride. So first of all, you have to allow God to reveal those things to you. Your inability, your sinfulness, your, your independence has brought you to the end of yourself and the ruin of your life. The second thing is, in verse 18, he starts just kind of rehearsing. He, he realizes what he needs to do. First of all, he realizes and sees where he's at. He's seen it. And then he begins to realize what he needs to do. Verse 18, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to get up and I'm going to go to my daddy. And I'm going to tell Daddy the truth. Daddy, I sinned against you, but more so, I sinned against heaven. I've sinned against God. And when you read this, how he rehearses it, and then how he does it, he always starts with God first. I sinned against heaven. I rebelled against God. Because ultimately, that's what we have to come to the place of. I am accountable to God. I have to stand before God. I have to answer to God. I'm going to have to speak to him about my inability, my excuses, whatever I think it was. I'm just going to have to be real about it. So he begins to realize the next steps. It's not just enough to see where I'm at. He begins to, he begins to reason. Isaiah 1 says, Come, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as wool. No, it's come, to, come to a place of your senses where you're willing to see yourself 
and say, this is despicable, this is, this is shameful, it's sin, it's, it's rebellion against God, but not just there, I'm gonna, this, gonna be, this, this, this requires a change in my life. And this is where a lot of people, they don't want to see a change in their life. It might require a change in your, your location. It might require a change in your attitude. It might require a change in your habits. It'll definitely require a change in your deeds. But it's going to require you to do something. It will require this one essential element, your will. You have to make a decision. Now, it takes more than your decision. It takes more than your will. It takes God. But if you want God to come in and to do something, then you have to open the door. You have to make a hard choice. I'm not staying like this any longer. I'm sick of this way of living. This is where the grace of God comes flowing like a rain. This is where the power of God comes moving. How often did I use the excuse and say, I, oh, I, I, I'd like to live that way, but I can't. It's not me. And I'm not going to play church. God wasn't wanting me to play church. I had half of it, right? The other part was it wasn't me. I couldn't do that. But this is where when you decide to say, I know what I can't do, I know what I can do, I can't do that, but I'm going to do it anyway. That's when God meets you right there. That's when God enables, and that's when God empowers, and that's when you see deliverance. That's when you see the change. That's when you see God move in such a way. So first of all, there's this, 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 uh, this recognition uh, of where I am, realization of what I need to do. And then the third element, do it. You do it. You do the right thing. He's not saying that this is a miserable place. You know, I'm tired of feeding these pigs and I'm tired of living like a pig and I'm tired of smelling like a pig and being covered with the pig stuff. You know, I'm, I'm tired of eating pig food. I think I'll go back to my old buddies. No. That's what got him in the mess to start with. His old buddies were old buddies till all the money was gone. That's the way the world is, by the way. Once they've used you and got out of you what they want, when you become a nuisance and they're done with you. <laughs> Once you become needy, they're done with you. Once you have an issue, they're done with you. That's when God starts dealing with you. When you get to the end. He says, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do something here. I'm going to go to my father's house and confess my sin. Now, I believe this, this is where you see him move in such a way that, that, that it really, it invites this miraculous power of God that comes into our lives and invites the grace of God. And it doesn't have anything to do with how you feel about anything. It has everything to do with what you've done in submission of your life to Jesus. As we said, one, he recognizes his unworthiness, you know. He comes to this place of humility. I, I know we're living in a generation that, that kind of is this deserving generation. We, we think everybody owes us something. We think we deserve it. I mean, sure, I came in last, but when I was at school, they gave me a ribbon anyway. Sure, I'm the worst batter on the team, but they still gave me a trophy when I played the game. The, in the big world, it's not like that. When you grow up, it's not like that. You have to do something. You can't ride on everybody's coattail. You can't expect that everybody owes you something. You deserve something, because we don't. And one of the elements of that coming to our senses, realizing people are giving to me things, and I don't deserve anything they're giving me. I am unworthy. This is where we come to this place of humility. It, 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 this guy starts out, give me mine. He didn't do a thing to earn it. Yeah. Why is it his? Because it's daddy's, it must be mine. It must be mine. If it's, if it's in the family, it's got to belong to me. He doesn't come back like this, does he? I'll be a servant. I'd like to go to work for you, Dad. I don't deserve to be called your son. Can I, can, I just, can I just be around you? Can I just work for you? Can I do something? It's the whole idea is changing now. He, he recognizes where he repents and confesses his sins. Obviously, he repents. He leaves the pig pen. A lot of people want to confess their sin and stay in the pig pen. Doesn't work that way, by the way. All right? You may come to church, but you're just with a better class of pigs, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not speaking about you personally, okay? <laughs> you you, you got to get to the point and say, you know, you know, I've sinned. It might be today that some parents here need to sit down and they'll say, I blew it with you. It might be that some kids need to tell their parents, I'm sorry, I've blown it, I'm not a good kid. It might be some church members need to say, I haven't been genuine. It might be the point to say, I need God to do something in my life. 
Might be a time to sell some other believer. You know, hear reason like Gary said, I hadn't been genuine. I, I've been stuck. I've been in a rut. I, I hadn't been on fire for Christ. But he recognizes unworthiness. He repents of his sin and he realizes the indebtedness that he has. I just want to serve. I mean, there's so many things we could go into, but let me just wrap it up. He decided what he needed to, be, to do when he came to his senses and he did it. And when he heads home, what does he find? A father who's willing to work with him and more. Not just to hire him, but to forgive him and to receive him. A father who's ready to celebrate. There was a lot of celebration that went on in Belize, wasn't there? We see people get saved, people that, you know, we prayed with, or people we'd witnessed to on the streets and maybe come to the meeting and get saved, or people we met on the street that gave their life to the Lord right there. There's a lot of testimonies, a lot of celebration. All these kids in the school minister to them. There's a lot of celebration. We have no idea the kind of real celebration that goes on when somebody comes to the Lord. The Bible says there's rejoicing in heaven. And I can bet you my life that the rejoicing in heaven is a whole lot better than the rejoicing in most Baptist church. It's of another breed. It's of another kind. If it's another, it's a spiritual. To think that God loves me so much that he gave his only begotten son for me that when Joe Arms gave his life to Jesus, there was a party. I know my family had one. My brother had one. He'd been working me a long time. <laughs> but can we imagine just for a moment in heaven the party that broke loose? So I think I'd have one of my own. Amen. Now, the father's down there. He's looking down the road with longing. He sees his son coming. Now, this is a parable. But how often has it been true in so many lives as Jesus demonstrates? But he's speaking this parable to the Jews, and he wants them to catch something here uniquely and specifically. Not the need to repent it, so that's obvious, but he also wants them to understand something about the Father. Now, under the Mosaic Law, listen carefully, this Father had every right to take his son to the elders. Come with me, son. And appear before the elders at the temple and say, this is my son, little Joe. Stone him to death and turn him over to the elders. He could easily go to the elders and say, this is my son. He's been disobedient. This boy took my name and smeared it in the mud with the pigs. He took our family name and abused it. He took my money and wasted every bit of it. He's come home smelling like a pig, and now he wants something else. But he didn't. He said, this is my son. He was just living in death. And now he's come home. This robe is going to cover every stench and every blemish that he's experienced in his life. Clean. And he's going to, we're going to put shoes upon his feet. His walk is about to change forever. You're going to need some shoes. This ring symbolizing his legacy and his inheritance is now placed upon his hand. Ought to be punished, ultimately killed. Verse 20. And the boy arose and came to his father. But yet when he was a great way off, the father saw him. And had compassion and ran. He ran. He fell on the boy's neck and he kissed him. How do you come home? It's best to put your pride aside. It's best to come smelling like a pig, but come. It's best to come with the stench of the world all over you. Sometimes we think, well, I'll get this straight first and then I'll go home. You know, you just, you, you still just, you know, you just, uh, it's like taking a pig out of the pig pen. You can wash him off, but he's still a pig. And you can teach him how to only, holy, holy, holy. He's still a pig. We need to be changed in our hearts. And here's the God of grace and mercy who does a transformative work in our lives of washing, cleansing, giving us authority, and changing us forever. Would you stand with your heads bowed this morning?